Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Brothers and sisters in Islam, I welcome you with the universal greeting of Islam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I am Ayub Abdul Rahman from East Malaysia. I am a revert. I used to be known as Reverend Anthony Swami Viagulam and I used to be in the Roman Catholic Church. As a young boy, I was brought up in the Roman Catholic teachings and when I was 17 years old, I decided to join an Augustinian monastery because I was given to understand that there are three types of heaven. The first or the first class heaven is reserved for those who are monks who have sacrificed their pleasures of this world and have devoted their lives to the God Almighty. The second class heaven is reserved for women who have also renounced the society and have gone into a religious life. The third class heaven is for married people who still follow the teachings of Christianity and when they die, they are rewarded heaven for the third class level. Now, I was a very ambitious person, so I decided if I have to go to heaven, I want the best. So, I joined an Augustinian monastery and after my philosophy and theological studies, I went over to Germany. In Germany, I was trained to help people in the medical field. During my contact with the community in Germany, I met many Muslims, many good Muslims who are, you can say, fundamentalists. They follow the fundamentals of Islam. And I felt pity for them because according to what I had been taught, these good people will never have a chance to go to heaven because they have not been baptized with the water and the Holy Spirit. And unless they are baptized, they will not be able to go to heaven. So I prayed daily. You know, as a monk, we used to pray six times a day. So in the last prayer of the day, I especially prayed for these Muslims that God may bring them from darkness into light. So, one day, I told my superiors that when I go back to Malaysia, where Islam is the official religion, more than 50% of the population are Muslims, in order to convert them to Christianity, I have to know something about the background of their religion. So, my superiors decided I should do comparative studies on Islam and Christianity and I was given the privilege to go to Mill Hill in London and there I continued my studies. Brothers and sisters in Islam, one of the first few Muslim scholars that I met, they were from Libya. They were from the Islamic Call Society of Libya and they gave me many interesting books. Among them was an English translation of the Holy Quran translated by Mamaduk Pictol. This Quran I read from cover to cover and after I had completed reading for the second time, I began to have doubts within myself. I thought, that the Holy Bible is the only book of God and everything that is there is gospel truth. But after reading the Holy Quran, I found that most of the prophets whom I knew from the Old Testament, this Holy Quran was giving a different version about their life story. It said all the beautiful things, all the good things that these prophets have done. There was no question of incest, adultery, 
and all those bad things that I found in the Holy Bible. And I read the story of the Annunciation to the Blessed Virgin Mary and I compared it with the Quranic version and I found it was more acceptable to see the version from the Holy Quran. So, I had discussions with fellow Malaysians at the Malaysia Hall who were good Muslims and with long discussions with them, I decided that Islam is after all not so bad. So I wrote to my superior general from London saying that I have done a thorough study of Islam and Christianity and I find Islam has got the right answers. So can I opt out of the monastery and become a Muslim? Within a few weeks, I received a reply that I should come back to the headquarters and discuss with my superiors. So I returned to Germany and in front of me there was a tribunal of about 12 senior monks. With them, I discussed. I told them what made me change my mind and instead of showing some kind of understanding, they were very, very annoyed with me and they made an ultimatum. Unless I repent, I will be sent into the cells and I will not be able to go back to my own country. They reasoned out with me that they will take a photo of a gravestone with my name inscribed on it that I have met with a very serious accident and I had to be buried immediately and that's the end. I will have no contact with my family members in Malaysia. They were quite serious about their threat and I decided from that time onwards to follow whatever they say to save my skin and if I have to embrace Islam, if God wills that I should become a Muslim, I will decide it in a Muslim country. So I gave excuses that I have been doing a lot of studies with very little sleep and then they said I will be sent to a mental hospital in Switzerland. I was sent there for three months and during that three months I met many important people, that means writers on Christianity, among whom I met a very famous writer who writes many things about Jesus Christ. And I asked him during one of my conversations, personal conversations with him, does he really believe in what he writes? And he told me, actually, I am doing it because I have been asked to do it and I am promised a good sum of money when these books are published. So I said, you mean to say you do not believe in the divinity of Christ? He said, personally, no. So this was one of the strong reasons for me to leave Christianity and look for the truth in Islam. But anyway, after the three months in the mental hospital, I was sent back to Germany and there I spoke to my superiors that I would like to undergo a medical training so that when I go back to my home country I can do combine my missionary work with social work. So I was sent to Cologne and at the Caritas Institute I took up a course on medical lab technology. At the end of the training, I was told by my superiors to learn a little bit of Portuguese language because they have decided that I should go to Brazil. You know, under the vows of poverty, chastity and holy obedience, whatever the superior says, you must follow without any question. Poverty means that for as long as you are in service with them, you do not get any form of compensation, no financial 
compensation. But everything that you need, the basic needs are given to you. And chastity means for the rest of my life, I will not get married. Now, in those days, the earlier days when I was in the monastery, I thought that is the best thing to go to the first class heaven. But after reading the Quran and seeing the false teachings in the Bible, I decided otherwise. But I had to follow whatever instructions came from the superior. So I went to study Portuguese language. I was very sad. I thought I will never ever be able to go to a Muslim country and embrace Islam. But God has his way. About two weeks after the instruction was given that I will be going to Porto Alegre in Brazil, a telegram came from Ipo Pera saying that the monk who was in charge of a new hospital had fallen down from the staircase and broken his arm. And he will be sent back to Germany and as a replacement within 24 hours, someone else has to be sent back to Ipo to work in that hospital. The only choice they could think of at that time was me. Finally, Alhamdulillah, God had answered my prayer. You know, under the vows of poverty, chastity and holy obedience, whatever the superior says, you must follow without any question. Poverty means that for as long as you are in service with them, you do not get any form of compensation, no financial compensation. But everything that you need, the basic needs are given to you. And chastity means for the rest of my life, I will not get married. Now, in those days, the earlier days when I was in the monastery, I thought, that is the best thing to go to the first class heaven. But after reading the Quran and seeing the false teachings in the Bible, I decided otherwise. But I had to follow whatever instructions came from the superior. So I went to study Portuguese language. I was very sad. I thought I will never ever be able to go to a Muslim country and embrace Islam. But God has his way. About two weeks after the instruction was given that I will be going to Porto Alegre in Brazil, a telegram came from Ipo Pera saying that the monk who was in charge of a new hospital had fallen down from the staircase and broken his arm. And he will be sent back to Germany and as a replacement, within 24 hours, someone else has to be sent back to Ipo to work in that hospital. The only choice they could think of at that time was me. Finally, Alhamdulillah, God had answered my prayer. So I was sent back to Malaysia instead of Brazil. And there, I did not know how to go about to become a Muslim. I was in this monastery in Ipo. So it took me some time, and once I contacted a Muslim convert by the name of Jakob Scholler, also a German, I told him of my personal wishes, and he introduced me to the first Prime Minister of Malaysia, the late Tunku Abdul Rahman, and gave me the Holy Quran. But still, I was not guided on how to go about to embrace Islam. Once I had plucked enough courage, I spoke to the regional superior for Asia and I mentioned to him of my wishes to leave the monastery and become a Muslim. He said, this is a very serious decision. I have to put it in writing and address to the superior general. So I followed his instructions and wrote a letter to the Superior General of the Augustinian Monastery. After about two months, I received a reply that they cannot force and keep me in the monastery, but definitely I will not be given any financial compensation for the 12 years of service. So I left the monastery 
and went home. When I went home, I thought my parents would have more understanding and will receive me with open arms. I was mistaken. My mother was not at all happy that I had left the monastery a secure place to become a Muslim. She said, what is so good about the Malay community? In Malaysia, Islam is always uh, thought of as the religion of the Malay community. So if a Malay does not live a good life, they say Muslims are no good. So we have black sheep everywhere in every society. But the Malay community were the ones who were supposed to give the image of the true Islam. So they, my mother said that she will not accept me as her son and I should leave. So I did not know where to go. Being in the monastery for more than 12 years, I was so used to that secure life. So now I had to go again to look for people who will look after me. I decided to go to Kuala Lumpur where I have an elder brother. And there I spoke to him and I told him of my position. He was sympathetic, but at the same time he did not know what to do. He said, you can stay with me, but don't make it too obvious because, you know, I am staying with in-laws and if they come to know I am supporting you, not only you will be chased out, I will be chased out with you. So I stayed with him for about a week. In between, I had applied for further studies and during that one week while I was with my brother, a letter came from Australia that I had been selected to undergo a six-month training in Melbourne University. So I went to the Qantas Airlines where they had sent my ticket and left for Australia. While in Australia, during my training, I was already making plans. What do I do after the training? So I decided to look for advertisements where they advertise for medical workers for Saudi Arabia. And once I found that application, the vacancy form, I applied to Dr. Baksh Hospital in Jeddah and I was offered a position as medical lab scientific officer. So I decided to come back to Malaysia after the six months training and I embraced Islam in Malaysia at the residence of the Chief Minister of Sarawak and after three days left for Jeddah to work in a medical center. During this time, I made several trips to Mecca, made my Umrah, came to know more about Islam and after the contract of two and a half years, I was invited back to Sarawak to set up a medical center in Kuching. The chief minister also advised me to get married because I'm no more a monk. But unfortunately, in the 12 years as a monk, nobody taught me how to date. So I did not know how to go about choosing a life partner. Usually in our Indian custom, it is customary that the parents look for a bride. But in my case, my parents were against my decision to become a Muslim. So they will not look for a good Muslim bride. But Allah has his ways. By accident, my conversion ceremony, the photos that were taken was published in a very leading Islamic magazine. And by accident, my wife also saw this magazine. And she said, he is a former Roman Catholic monk, a forgiver of sins. And now he has come to Islam. He must be a good person. So when we met casually through our social work, I also felt that if I have to get married, it should be somebody virtuous. Does not matter if she doesn't have wealth, if she's not very pretty, not the prettiest in the whole country, but she has virtue. So I decided to marry her, went to approach her parents, the parents were anti-Indians. They did not like Indians. So again, I had 
to wait. One day, the governor of Sarawak casually asked me, will I ever get married? I am going to remain as an Islamic monk. So I told him, I want to marry local girls, but the parents don't like me. During my weekly visits to His Excellency, the governor of Sarawak, he asked me very casually, have I found the right girl to get married? And I told him of my problems. I said, Finally, I have found a virtuous woman, but unfortunately, her parents do not want an Indian son-in-law. He was taken aback, so he instructed one of his lady ministers to visit this home and find out what was the thing that they did not like in me. And when the minister went to visit this family, they said, they had doubts whether I am a married man, perhaps I have a wife in India, perhaps I have another wife in West Malaysia, and now I have come to Kuching and asking for the hand of the one and only daughter. So the minister reassured them that I was a former Roman Catholic monk, I was never married, and I live a very good, virtuous life, and it is only fitting that if the daughter agrees that I should be married to her. So after these things were explained very nicely to my present mother-in-law, she called for a meeting of all her relatives with me and there they started asking me whether I don't know how to recite the Fatiha, whether I pray five times a day, whether I know the fundamentals of Islam, and when I had answered them very correctly, then they decided on the amount of money I should spend for the wedding. When they asked for 7,000, I said, why not make it a round number, make it 10,000. They were taken aback, because I had saved my money. So we decided on that day that we will spend $10,000 and we had a very simple wedding, but to make it very, very memorable, even the governor of Sarawak attended my wedding. So in 1983, 27th March, I got married to my present wife. And I have now two sons and work in a clinic in Kuching, but I'm doing da'wah because in the past many years as a Christian monk, I had baptized many, many thousands of non-Christians and have brought Christianity to them. So now, I, in a, to repent for all my wrong deeds in the past, I am doing da'wah to all the rural areas in Sarawak. I wish to conclude, wa billahi taufiq wal hidayah wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.